Hello everyone and welcome to Digitally Transforming Faculty Development and Increasing Access to African Higher Education. This is the latest in a global series of roundtable discussions brought to you in partnership between Times Higher Education and PwC. My name is Alistair Lawrence, I'm the Special Projects Editor at THE and I'll be chairing today's discussion. But before we begin, I'd like to hand over to Dion Chango, who is Africa Central and Southern Africa CEO at PwC, who's going to talk a little bit about how PwC are supporting universities in the region. Dion. Thank you so much, Alistair, and good morning, good day, everybody, and a warm, warm welcome to uh, our panel of um, esteemed members of academia uh, today for our roundtable discussion um, regarding digital access and transformation. Um, as PwC, we have a purpose and we define that purpose as being the need to build trust in society and to solve important problems. That is the reason why we exist. That is the value that we want to add and that is the difference we want to make in society. In many respects, we are also a training institution, which in some ways makes us very similar to being an academic institution or a university, a place of learning. And I say this because every single year, we are a key stakeholder to the academic fraternity because we take on quite a number of graduates that they produce every year. And so we take a keen interest in the standard of education and the quality of outcomes that are produced by universities and higher and other higher education institutions, not only in South Africa, but across the African region. Because we are a people's business, we see it as one of our core functions to make sure that we promote education in all the communities where we have a presence. It is for that reason, that in driving our greater societal purpose part of our strategy, we have identified education as being one of the SDGs that is the specific component that will help us bring to life how we have greater societal impact as an organization. Now, in our core functions, we serve many clients. And we have a number of clients in the higher education sector. We have a proud record of being the external auditors to many universities in South Africa and other parts of the African continent. And at those higher education institutions where we are not the external auditors, then we provide other types of non-audit services as a way of making sure that we assist those institutions to solve their most important problems. Now, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, like other sectors, the higher education sector has faced some challenges. It has been required to adapt and respond in many ways to this pandemic. One of the ways is through access and the degree with which higher education institutions have been able to continue operating seamlessly and making available the content that they provide normally using digital channels. This has been more challenging for some institutions than what it has been for others. And in a continent that was already plagued by issues of low access for some or poor access for some, to higher education or quality education. COVID-19 has just exacerbated this problem and really shone the spotlight on really the haves and have nots here on the African continent, but also in other parts of the world. And so working together with higher education institutions, we as PwC are really interested in sparking a dialogue on what can be done to help institutions really improve uh, accessibility to their own content, even in a post-pandemic world. And what are the lessons that should be taken away going forward that have been brought to the fore by COVID-19? So our commitment to the higher education sector 
has never been more intense. We continue to partner with universities and other institutions across the continent in any way that we can. And through some of our own initiatives, such as something that we call new world, new skills, we have committed to playing our role together and in collaboration with other actors in society to ensure that we contribute to the digital upskilling of the communities where we have footprint in order to ensure that we bring everybody along on this journey um, into a much more digital future and to ensure that nobody is left behind in order to get them digitally upskilled and ready to be employed in a much more digital world. These are just some of the reasons why we find it so important and so compelling to play a part in convening a discussion in a round table such as this one, to hear firsthand from our leaders of the educational institutions of some of the challenges that they face on a daily day, some of the risks that they have to mitigate against, and of course, some of the exciting opportunities they see for the future. And in so doing, then all of us can come away from these discussions more rejuvenated, more inspired about the role that education can play in the growth and development of the African continent. And so I'm really excited and very inspired to hear what our leaders have to say today. And I look forward to the roundtable discussion. So Alistair, thank you very much and all the best for the next 50 minutes or so. Great, thank you very much, Dion. So yes, as, as Dion said, both faculty development and increasing access to higher education persist as challenges around the world and Africa is no exception to that. Therefore, creating more innovative learning environments will be key to unlocking Africa's potential as technology continues to enhance what, what universities can offer. With that in mind, I'd like to be I'd like to begin by asking the panel for their thoughts on how embedding faculty support in universities' digital transformations will, will benefit their institutions. What are the new requirements for supporting faculties as, as universities continue to change quite rapidly? Um, Dr. Nidig, can I come to you first, please? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, I think one of the key issues as we start to look at this blurring between the analog and digital worlds is our state of readiness of our academics or faculty, as you call it, uh, to embrace this divide. Now, I think we've already alluded to um, the digital inequalities that's prevalent in our country, so I'm not going to speak a little bit, of, uh, I'm not going to touch that. But I do think that at a curricular level, we need to start engaging with new theories of change and new educational models that we need to start thinking through. Um, if you look at the literature review over the last 10 years, what we are beginning to find is that yes, there has been uh, talk around curricular reinvigoration or curricular reimagination um, and, and those sorts of concepts. But what we have not seen is a, a unifying theme around the praxis, the, the, the practitioner research interface. What are our academics on the ground experiencing and how this is translated into academic or educational theory? So for us, very importantly, uh, we find trying to keep a bimodal approach going. In other words, continuing to do what we have been doing, but finding new ways of doing the new things. And I think the pandemic has really um, acted as a catalyst um, to, to, to spur up uh, the, the rate of change that is needed within the institutions. So from our view is that um, the change that we want to see happening at faculty level, it, it cannot be done by artificial intelligence or machine learning. It's something that we need to work through within our uh, community of practice to look at revitalizing our curricula and to making sure that this triangular relationship between the curriculum, um, the teaching and learning methodologies, our learning outcomes are aligned. And the last point that I want to just touch on a little bit here is uh, us beginning to explore the so-called quadruple helix relationship between the institution
institution. And I think Dion has already indicated the relationship between the institution, industry, uh, society, and, and policy. Um, and I think if we move in sync, uh, we might be able to kind of see a leapfrog, actually, um, some of the other national systems of education and, and try to attain some of the educational outcomes that we envisaged. I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much. Um, Bill, how, how much does this resonate with what you're trying to do to support faculty at your, your institution? Thank you and good morning to all of us. Um, and good day, actually. Uh, I think it resonates very much, uh, but I'd just like to make a, a, a point that from my experience, fundamental to the effort to embed uh, this change within faculty is the need to hear and listen to faculty and understand what their limitations are. I think the pandemic sort of forced all of us to move digital, to move online, to start doing things very rapidly. We found that we had to take a pause. We managed to do it, but we had to take a pause. And I think it's, it's important for all of us as leaders of institutions to, in that pause, hear what faculty members are saying in respect of what their difficulties are. I think uh, uh, whilst we, there's a connect with, with industry and so on, there's also the important issue of connecting with the training requirements of faculty in this particular area, because really it's not just moving online or even just having digital uh, technology at work. You need to understand what to do. And for me, the key thing I'd say at this point is embedding it requires that we listen to faculty and hear what the difficulties are that they have. So how does that um, process take, has it taken shape or starting to shape, take shape? Is it a case of um, setting up better feedback loops with faculty? Is it about putting digital tools in place that let faculty report and communicate more, more freely? Yeah, so what we're doing really is having heads of departments and deans actually sit with groups of faculty and say, look, what are the difficulties that you have? I mean, you know, without, uh, belaboring the point, you have to teach online, you have to relate to students online, you have to use various technologies. So how are you doing it? And what are the challenges that you're having? And then from those sorts of interactions, we're having some feedback from them. So because of that, we've run a number of a series of training programs, and we're trying to morph our uh, learning management systems to be a little more adaptive, and to find other technologies and tools that we can add to the, to the core learning management system that we have. So it's we're using a very personal sort of one-on-one -on -one group, focus group type approach to this process. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Professor uh, Fakeng, if you, I see, sorry, I, I meant to mention at the start, if you do have a point to make in response to another panelist, please use the uh, raised hand button in, in Zoom. It just makes me a little bit, makes it a little bit easier for me to spot you when someone would like to speak. But um, uh, Professor Fakeng, go ahead, please. All right, so, so, so for, for us, the, the best way to embed faculty support for digital transformation is to provide them with a centrally located center that focuses on developing facilities, tools, and expertise designed just for them to use in their course development and teaching practices. It's, it's, it, we find that if you leave it to individuals, it can be pretty tricky. So we've set up, uh, we have in the university, the Center for Higher Education, a development that has been in existence for quite a while and, and its role is to promote equity of access, effectiveness of teaching and learning and enhancement of curricula with the twin aims of improving student success and ensuring that UCT's graduateness are globally competitive, locally relevant, socially responsive and fully representative of South Africa's diverse, diverse population. This center, it functions as a faculty uh, even though it doesn't offer programs. Uh, it includes, it's got a dean and academic staff and as well as researchers. And it oversees UCT's academic development program. It also oversees the, uh, we have the design thinking school, that's uh, the Hasso Plattner School of Design Thinking, Career Services, Center for Educational Testing for Access and Placement, and the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching. So if you have this center that works with faculties, it can coordinate uh, different areas 
staff development, course and curriculum design, and educational, educational technologies so that academics have that support that they don't have to worry about where they get help. It is here in the center. So, and it's not just educational technologies. I mean, as I say, there's also educational support programs for students. And, and within, as I said, within the center, we have the, the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, which responds to the teaching and learning challenges at UCT and the broader higher education environment through learner-centered pedagog pedagogic practices. And so we support that through the center, we can support curriculum initiatives underpinned by, by values and skills ranging from graduate attributes and digital literacies to community engagement and social justice. It gives us that strength. And so at the beginning of the lockdown last year, when we moved online, it wasn't just the responsibility of the academics to move online because we are on, long, on lockdown. We didn't even have to pause and say, let's train people, all right? So, so uh, we, we already had about 60% of UCT's academics who have transferred their teaching courses into online modules. And so we all what we did is that we organized webinars to help academics, those who hadn't caught on, adjust to what we call emergency remote teaching in a very short turnaround time. And those materials that we put there, we made them available to other institutions under the Creative Commons license as a way to support higher education across the African continent. And so that's for us, that kind of a center allows us to do that because whether there's a crisis or not, it, it remains a resource for students because the use of digital resources are also important, not just for the lockdown, but also to support student learning and success. So, so that's how we, we, we have organized and that's how we grow in this. I mean, we, we also have within this Center for Higher Education Development, the One Button Studio uh, that functioned long before the lockdown that uh, um, academics could just walk in and, and um, record their lessons, um, uh, you know, whatever they want to do online. We have the curriculum and course design cluster, which provides support to UCT staff and, de de and departments in course design and strategies for effective teaching and learning, as well as using alternative modes of teaching. So, so the, 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 the beauty of it is that it's not, a, it's not a crisis response center. It's a center that's seen as central to improving teaching and learning and, and as well as student success within the university. Brilliant, thank you very much. It's, it's great to hear that you have such a comprehensive response and something that's in a place that stands like it has real um, lasting power and, and that will be able to serve so many people even after the pandemic subsides. There's a, I think there's four of you with your hands raised, so you have to bear with me. I'll try and get through you in, um, in order. Um, uh, Professor Jerry, can we come to you first, please? Oh, you're on mute. There you go. Sorry, uh, a very good afternoon to you all. It's uh, already quarter past one here in Mauritius, so uh, we are already in the in the afternoon. Uh, I, I would tend to agree with uh, with what my my colleagues have said uh, previously. However, I would just like to emphasize on a few points. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, number one point is that uh, uh, I would not associate you know this uh, movement towards digital transformation. Uh, uh, as something which is linked, you know, to COVID-19. And, uh, and Professor Fakin uh, just, just said it, uh, it should not be linked with that. Why? Uh, the whole computer-mediated teaching and learning, the whole process of online delivery, blended mode of teaching, started back in the 1990s. We see it 30 years down the road. And uh, so uh, uh, we, 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 sh we have done a lot of progress towards, you know, implementing uh, such kind of, you know, delivery. Uh, now, probably mo uh, many universities have not got to that. And this is the problem we face in universities. We've got so much of rigid structures. We have so much of difficulty to embrace change that, you know, all of a sudden we think that, you know, there is something magical happening and we all need to go through it. But it's a long-term process. It's a process where uh, uh, at the University of Mauritius back in the 1990s, we had a center for distance learning. 
that Center for Distance Learning evolved into uh, a virtual center for innovative uh, and learning. It then evolved into a center for lifelong learning. So it, it has, it has, it's something that goes, you know, it's an evolu evolutionary uh, uh, sort of process. It's not something that, you know, happens overnight. So uh, that is point number one that we need to take into, into account. I think the second important point is that we need to get at the leadership level, at the helm of the university, we need to get our staff understand. And when I say staff, it's not just about academic staff. We're not here just talking of digital transformation where only the academic staff are concerned. We have to get the, the, the talk to the non-academic staff as well, to the support staff, because uh, you know, the whole area of digital transformation is about not only just about uh, tools, about processes. Importantly, it's about uh, people. So the whole of the university is here concerned. And so when we talk of uh, the whole of the university, we get, need to get a message through, across, uh, that uh, we live in a world where Industry 4.0 is there. It's, it's a reality. Uh, many, in many parts of the world, we're talking of society for 5.0. I'm not sure whether uh, we can talk of uh, uh, society 5.0 in other parts of the, uh, uh, of the, of the African continent. Uh, but these are realities. And how do we get the message through to our people for them to understand that we cannot do otherwise? Uh, I recently uh, you know, submitted an article uh, which I entitled From Online... Uh, delivery to digital transformation, the new normal of universities. I truly believe that this is an evolutionary process. There's no way we can do otherwise. We have to embrace it. And we are obviously, we don't, are not at the same level everywhere. So we need to find ways and means to get to that. That is very important. And, and those are the points that uh, uh, I think uh, I, I wanted to bring here for the discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Jerry. Um, Professor Peterson, if I can come to you next, just to ask about how, how this is being implemented at, at your institution, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Alistair. And I would like to respond to your question uh, by starting to say that different universities obviously have different trajectories uh, of the evolutionary approach that uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Jury, have mentioned. Um, so at, the, at our university, we started with our strategy uh, a few years ago. Um, and the strategy is really premised on how do you deliver the academic project from face to face to online? And what is the spread in between? And then, they, then we say, what do you need to deliver that? Um, and the need is not only people focused, uh, uh, and I agree, it is people, academics plus non-academics, but it's also focused on the technology uh, the compatibility of the technology and other, and other things that need to look at, and then the governance that goes with it. So that is how we engaged with that strategy a few years ago. And, and to come to your specific question, uh, part of that was the development of what we called the uh, digital faculty. Now, remember when uh, uh, what COVID-19 had done, COVID-19 really have just accelerated the implementation of the strategy. Uh, uh, so the strategy was already there. It was just how quickly we should have adapted. And I, surely in our institution, it might have also been other institution that we really started with what we call remote teaching and learning uh, rather than complete online. Uh, because as you know, designing an online course uh, is not something that happened in two or three months. It can happen uh, about a year or, 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 or 18 months. And you need to make sure that they are, uh, that are um, correctly equipped. So, so we have a combination of those two. We support the faculty. So a lot of the academics and the support staff are exposed to this digital faculty uh, where we know how do you conceptualize a course? How do you make it online? But also the very important aspects, and are we still in our baby shoes with respect to that? It is the things that comes to the pedagogy, the um, the, the the quality assurance, the uh, uh, um, the evaluation of those things. A lot of research, I believe, still need to be done in that area, and that is what we are doing at the moment. So, so for me, 
using aspects like data analytics to understand things better. That's all part of our digital faculty. And I think the point I want to bring across, Alistair, is that uh, uh, it's good to have platforms like this that we could learn from one another because we are all in different stages of the trajectory. But uh, uh, but but the the focus for us was really about how do we implement our strategy that we developed about three, say three or four years ago. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Peterson. Um, Professor Kwadi, can I come to you next, please, just to pick up on a couple of points that people have made about. Um, you know, this idea of creating digital faculty, making sure that faculty have the skills that they need to teach online, um, and also building something long standing that can be used as a resource that is not simply seen as a, as a response to the pandemic, but something that can help universities build for the future. How is that taking shape at NWU? Uh, we, we, we have a center of distance learning, and from that center, the COVID, learning, the COVID experience just caught us on way because through the center, we were actually migrating quite a number of our programs into the center so that we can access quite a lot of our students. It was just as a way of promoting access so that we can actually reach as many students and as far as possible. And the only challenge of course was that being predominantly rural and operating within a rural context, the connectivity issues are the ones that are only a little bit of a challenge to us that are outside our control where the student is out there and is completely in an area where he's out of reach. But from the university point of view, I think we are in a very good trajectory in terms of meeting our dream in terms of reaching the students out there. And as far as capacitating the faculty, the staff, uh, we, we have the department that deals with the distance learning that also from an IT point of view, the staff can receive assistance from that particular department. We have also opened a name similar department now for students access as well, because not only staff have got challenges in terms of this, but students can also use that department to facilitate their connectivity and all the challenges they might be facing. Thank you. And how has that, how has the response changed to that over the past 18 months? Has it been something that people have been very enthusiastic about or has it required more training than you anticipated in order to get people to use these new tools? We have actually experienced a very speedy uh, catching up from both students and staff point of view. Our staff managed to get on board as soon as uh, possible, and our students are also on board. Initially, in the beginning of the COVID experience, it was a little bit slow. But as for now, I think it's almost like an oiled machine. Great, well, congratulations. I'm glad it's going well. Um, Professor Amar, can we come to you next, please, to tell us about how the prep, what scope you think there is for, for innovation and allowing faculty to teach in different ways and also to form better feedback loops with students so you can perhaps personalize learning in a way that helps you retain students and helps you maximize student outcomes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alistair, for the opportunity. Uh, I will say that uh, the University of Cape Coast has what is called the Center for Teaching Support and uh, the College of Distance Education. So even before COVID, uh, ensued, we had systems in place for digital learning, uh, but I would say that most colleagues had not utilized it to the fullest. Uh, there was a lot of inertia, given the fact that some of our faculty are digital immigrants. Uh, they were not so much uh, enthused about the digital transformation agenda, and, and that inertia really uh, worried us. But then the investor had to put in place some systems to ensure that they migrated to the online platform. And we know that uh, the College of Distance Education also has one of the highest number of students in Ghana, uh, over 50,000 or 60,000 students are in distance learning mode. So that facility was already there. We just needed to make sure that a lot of people transition to using our digital systems or platform model and all of that uh, in the system. We found that uh, there was the need for us to undertake a needs assessment that look at the infrastructure in place, look at the systems that we have in place, and then look at the gaps and how we can 
actually uh, fill those gaps. And here, survey of faculty played an intrinsic role in, in ensuring that we've done a, an effectiveness assessment, which will help us to do the transition. And then we, we also needed to nest the kind of initiative that we're doing at the institutional level in the institutional goals, national goals, supranational goals, such as Agenda 2063, uh, the SDGs. We wanted to make sure that it was a constellation of policies that is driving our agenda, uh, uh, as, as, as we say. And then we also made sure that this transformation was not limited only to academic uh, staff because we realized that most of the administrative work uh, will also play a key role when it comes to uh, access to the services that we are deploying as part of uh, this online uh, system. We were thinking about the research and innovation ecosystem and block and how our partnership that we have, we could leverage on the opportunities therein to expand our access to digital uh, services for faculty and then for students. Uh, we, we were thinking of big data uh, knowledge platforms uh, media sharing platforms, service oriented platforms, science data knowledge platforms, and how we can harness the potential all of these uh, platforms offer us as an institution. I believe that uh, one of the key things that also ensure that we're able to do this in a seamless manner is the vice chancellor's vision of making the University of Cape Coast an entrepreneurial university, a university that is not responding per se, but is also taking action before something happens. So uh, a, a university that is uh, proactive rather than just responsive to uh, some of those things. So in a nutshell, this is what uh, I'll say. Okay, thank you. I had a couple of quick follow-up questions. The, the needs assessment that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, how long did it take to, to undertake or is it is it an ongoing process where you- Yeah, yeah so I think that's a fantastic question. We, we took one month to do the needs assessment. But then, as you said, it's also evolving. It's not something which is episodic. So we, we are still doing this assessment based on uh, things that are evolving from what we have uh, done already. So once we implement something, we see needs emanate from the implementation, and then we go ahead to do it. So it's evolving. But the initial needs assessment took one month because we needed to know the capacity that we have and then how to expand capacity and to make sure that issues about accessibility and availability are not compromised as we move to the digital platforms. Okay, and another question I had was about the, the new platforms that you mentioned, particularly those relating to science subjects and ones that are always highly in demand from industry and, and other employers. Does this give you the opportunity to work more closely with industry partners to make your graduates more employable? Does it give you opportunities to engage with your alumni after they've graduated so you can form stronger links with industry that way as well? Yeah, this is also a fantastic question. Uh, we, we, we did a stakeholder assessment and we realized that uh, some of the partners that we, we normally send our products to had problems with the graduates that we have. Uh, issues about confidence came to the fore and we needed to take critical steps to address it. That means that we should give our students a lot of opportunities to present either in groups or individually to build their self-confidence. Sometimes you realize that they have the material, but then they've not been exposed to uh, uh, a system where they can really engage and, and, and then uh, ask questions uh, that are critical for advancing knowledge. So we made sure that we were working closely with our partners, particularly the Venture Capital Trust Fund, which was giving us indication of some of the lapses that they have identified in our graduates so that we respond to this uh, uh, need and then fill the gaps that they, they identified. So that is how we went about it. We also made sure that the alumni also give us feedback regarding what they missed out in the content and the curriculum that we have, so that we can now make sure that we integrate it in the revision of our curriculum. We've said that we want to make sure that our curriculum resonates strongly with 21st century core competencies and skills. This means that our students should be critically engaged. They should be uh, problem solvers. They should be entrepreneurial in outlook. And that's, this means uh, 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 transforming our, uh, not just our curriculum, but transforming even the, the intellect, the mindset of our, our faculty to ensure that they are abreast with these core competences in order to even facilitate the delivery of such. Great, thank you very much. Um, 
Dr. Nadia, can I come to you next about that question of core competencies? Because for those who don't know, you're the Chief Information Officer and Executive Director at, at TUT in South Africa. And uh, obviously coming from a, a CIO background, such as you, as you do, is it important that people don't get too preoccupied with the, the functionality of what digital education can offer and that you use it as an opportunity to teach the skills that students and staff will need so that you know the platforms are working for them rather than the other way around? Uh, thank you, Alistair. I think uh, one of the things that we did, uh, we did correctly at this institution was to appoint someone with a curriculum background as their chief information officer, not someone with an IT background. So, so um, you know, so IT is is one part of it. I just want to just touch on one one thing about innovation and and uh, driving innovation within institutions. Um, I think my colleague from Mauritius mentioned this. It's it's not just advancing the academics. We can we we will find a a polarized institution with two groups of people being on the opposite end of digital competencies. So yeah, TUT, what we did is we created what was called a digital, a digital commons or a digi commons. Uh, this is a space where we bring people in to come in to look at driving open innovation, the so-called entrepreneurs, the people who are solutions driven and who've got ideas and find themselves being stifled by bureaucracy or usually the person that they report to. So for us, we, we started in 2017 with our new strategic plan where we wanted to be a digitally advanced university. And, and we saw this being in, in three forms, um, a shift in culture. We, we needed to change the ways in which we think about the way in which we work and engage with our people and all our role players and stakeholders. Uh, a shift in workforce. Um, it's good to have um, ambitious goals about digital transformation, but if your people are not ready to move in that direction or do not have the skill sets to do that, then that creates a, a further bottleneck and leads to failures in these transformation initiatives. We too have a, a design thinking approach to um, finding the ways in which we can bring about changes within this. And then of course, the shift in technologies. So our focus has primarily been on our people and our key stakeholders, that is our students, the academic staff, the administrative staff, and then the focus on the technology. Um, we, we have consistently said that technology is not the end in itself. It is how we utilize it to bring about the kinds of transformative elements we want to see within the institution. So, so from our side, it has always been driven by the curriculum and driven by our teaching and learning processes. And of course, um, in terms of our research and innovation, we, we adopt a, an impactful uh, a set of metrics uh, to look at how successful we are on that. And again, the point mentioned, you know, as a, it depends where an institution is in its developmental trajectory. Um, we are just 16, 17 years old post merger. And we, uh, we had to encompass a wide range of uh, services and provide for a range of students so early on within the, um, when the pandemic hit, we had to do a geospatial study to find out where our students were and in terms of their access um, to, to digital uh, media and content and simple things like connectivity. So for us, um, it's, it's about developing innovation spaces. Um, we do have a center for or higher education development and support doing kind of the things that uh, Prof. Bakeng mentioned. But for us, it's about finding and creating spaces for innovation to happen within the institution. And, and hopefully out of that, we in two to three years, we will see a new innovation type beginning to emerge within the institution. Thanks, Great, thank you. No, thank you. It's interesting about the long-term planning that goes on, which is, you know, I think it's one of the main challenges that university leaders cite when I've done a lot of these interviews over the past 18 months and with everybody being in recovery mode for the past or response mode rather for the first maybe six or 12 months of the pandemic. Now these plans are starting to take shape where really, people really do um, plan for the future effectively. Um, Dr. Biriba, if I could come to you next, please, if you, if you could tell us a little bit about um, your, your work at University of Cape Coast. I, I'm particularly interested, coming from a STEM background such as you do, you know, what responses and what changes have been necessary in, in, the, in that discipline over, over the course of, 
of, of digital, this digital transformation process. Thank you very much. So I think that is one of the issues that I really wanted to touch on in this discussion, that some of these digital transformations need to um, take into cognizance the various disciplines and how they may be affected a bit differently. Some of the challenges that affect the sciences and, and, and programs that require um, real laboratory work and actual contact with patients and things like that, which are my background, you notice that the move to us, it really was an emergency online um, teaching really impacted these disciplines differently. So for example, in the College of Health and Allied Sciences in the University of Cape Coast, specific arrangements had to be made that were a bit different from what was done for other colleges to be able to go into this emergency um, online teaching mode. So here you need to consider different approaches to delivery, which would be flexible enough to allow some level or don't lose the content of being able to have some practicals, being able to also do the things that needed to be done with industry in this context, the health services and laboratories and what needed to be done there, what could actually be delivered um, in, in online mode and what could not be fully done in, in online mode had to be clearly structured in this way. So the, the fact is that moving to a digital transformation must be really embedded in the strategic planning such that at that stage, there is more room to look at it specific disciplines and see what must be done for one discipline to ensure that whilst we continue delivering the content, we are also able to build the skills that are needed where these skills require practical contact periods. And so it has to be part of the process and therefore even currently as the university prepares to draft a new strategic plan to start from 2022, an online survey is ongoing now that is asking for some of these details about how some of these changes, emergency online teaching affected practical uh, modules, affected courses that require clinical skills in hospitals and what people would want to see. So the idea is that, yes, it was an emergency response, but once that we found a way to survive it sort of, we now need to look at how to properly embed this digital transformation in the institutional culture in a way that does not impact negatively on any discipline. And this is where further needs assessment and further evaluation of what was done is currently going on. And with that, it can help to make sure that the strategies that are finalized or put in place moving forward will be one that allow for a more hybrid and flexible approach of delivery such that all the various disciplines in the sciences in the colleges can still have a way to embrace this digital transformation without losing on the, the delivery. And, and this is something that cannot be avoided because really these programs are ones that people really subscribe to and there are a lot of interest and therefore they must also be delivered in a way that ensure at the end quality of the products that come out is not compromised especially when you are training people for the health sciences you definitely need to ensure that when they come out they are safe enough to go out there and therefore in this new digital age that is something that is really being worked out and i believe all institutions globally actually are looking at various modes of ensuring that um, other systems of um, digital delivery can be employed and used in a way to still effectively give the content that must be delivered. Thank you very much. I, I, I'd like to come to Professor Docu next, just because I, I believe your colleague, if, uh, Dr. Barry Bar, you, you're both at the same institution. I was wondering how the how this impact is you've seen the change on research and delivering that quality in research and the other challenges that you've had to overcome in order to 
um, again, taking us back to what we spoke about right at the beginning of the hour, that staff are properly supported, but also that you have the feedback loops that you need with your staff for continuous improvement. Uh, first doctor, that, yeah. First well, doctor. that's in me. Oh no, sorry. It was. Uh, it was for. Um, sorry, David Doherty, who's also on the line with us. I think just. Uh, yeah, to David. All right. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. sorry. So, thank you very much. I agree with the previous speakers that um, um, the digital infrastructure were already in place even before COVID, and uh, COVID has made it um, a bit more um, has facilitated the need to speed up with that, and universities are doing that. Um, very well. But uh, I should say that the aspect of equity is what needs to be looked at again. Uh, equity in terms of uh, availability and accessibility. Now it's widely available in most places, but how accessible is it across the different categories of students and then the different categories of discipline, as uh, my colleague has just said. So we need to critically look at that. How do we support, now we're talking about staff within the universities, but how do we also support students who are coming from less endowed um, schools, secondary schools to enter, who are going to be uh, enrolled onto this uh, digital system? Is this something that has to be started already to be um, training them around in the, in the secondary school or is this um, so that when they come, they will have some orientation kind of to take them through. So my major concern is about the equity aspect of it, equity in terms of how it's going to um, be used by all students, equity in terms of how it can be feasible to be applied to all discipline. And then the issue about internet connectivity is still a major challenge. I mean, it, many places and then uh, so while the uh, facility or infrastructure is available its accessibility is really a huge challenge and that is why i would yeah. think that universities have to think about redesigning the entire digital architecture um, so that uh, it addresses the changes uh, the different disciplines that addresses the um, um, the different uh, categories of students that we, we have. Um, I, I am thinking that um, when the architecture, uh, digital architecture were designed, it wasn't meant to be applied to the entire uh, student populations. In our part, for example, it was targeted, um, for example, for uh, distance education students, the mostly distance education, the unknown science students, they don't have practice, practice uh, practical uh, lessons and so on and so forth. So the system was designed with certain use in mind. Now with the shift uh, brought, by, by, uh, brought about by COVID-19, there is a need for us to look at that design very well and so that it can be um, worked on to address all the issues. I have a tiny question for um, a colleague who presented something on the shift in the workforce. How has in been uh, implemented? Uh, do they have to recruit persons to suit the specific uh, digital design or do they have to train staff and what has been the challenges or the lessons to learn from that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just, we're quite tight for time. We've only got about 10 minutes left. So if you'll excuse me, I'll have to probably rattle through a few, pick on you quite quickly and uh, trying to speak to everyone in due course. Um, Actually, Professor Baby, if I could come to you next, just um, you're joining us from Kenya today. I, I, it'd be interesting to hear what your response is. Perhaps you can pick up on the point that Professor Doku made about improving equity of access and the challenges that persist around that. Is there a case now that university campuses will need to be reimagined? So you have the digital offering, but you also have a physical space that is available for people who quite simply will not have yeah, access right, to education right. if they do not come to the space. And maybe they are not sitting in a lecture theatre or sitting in a lab, but they also have the space that they need to learn and, and study privately or study in groups. Um, how is that starting to take shape at, at your institution? Thank you very much, uh, Alistair, for the question. Uh, I think 
I would agree with my colleagues that the bigger vision about uh, digital, digital education and so on is something that uh, goes beyond the COVID crisis that we've been facing. Uh, and in our case, we started with uh, uh, an open and distance learning center, uh, which has been running for over 10 years. But when the COVID crisis came, uh, there were modifications to that which we did. Uh, and one of the things that we've kind of settled on uh, is strengthening the ability to do just what you're saying, you know, to have students, a portion of students available on campus uh, and the majority of our students uh, available online uh, so that the students that are online pretty much have the same experience as the students that are physically on campus. Uh, but the challenge that uh, we face, and, and it would be interesting uh, to, to learn from the colleagues around the platform today, is how you deal sometimes with some of the, uh, what are called the policy and regulatory contradictions uh, that impact then on the decisions uh, and choices that we make as universities. Uh, for instance, there is a sense in which in, in, in the environment uh, that we're working in Kenya, there's some skepticism about quality of any education that's online uh, versus the traditional uh, physical contact learning where, you know, which we do under brick and mortar. So you've, how do you, you know, go over that skepticism uh, to do, you know, the innovative things that uh, we, 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 we're dealing with? And some of that also gets into the policy environment where we, un we all understand that we should uh, be doing a whole lot of things through internet, uh, but you see internet costs going up and taxation of, I mean, VAT and all other things are going up around uh, the cost of internet, the cost of, you know, uh, digital gadgets that students need to use uh, in order to be online. Um, it's, 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 you know, how you walk through that maze of policy contradictions to do what we must do to secure the future of education. What we are doing is almost reviving conversations that were kind of beginning to die in the academy around pedagogy, uh, particularly when you look at pedagogy as bringing together content, process, and outcome. Uh, so that when people begin to, to look at it from that way, then their appropriation of technology becomes a little bit uh, easier. Thank you very much. I have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. When you talk about um, sustainability and managing costs, do you think long-term this will require greater collaboration between universities, industry, and government in order to just sort of share the common good, really. I mean, ultimately, you're trying to create, you know, better student outcomes, more employable students, more skilled students. Does the university sector perhaps need more help than it's getting at a policy level? I personally believe that um, probably traditionally in the sense that uh, I believe that education is a common good. Uh, and that unless we, we, we stay on that road, of looking at education as something that is a common good that all of us should be investing in. Uh, in the long run, uh, sustainability of institutions is going to be affected. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got time for a couple more. Um, uh, Professor Songa, I, I, thank you for joining us. Um, can you give us some insights into um, how the, the long-term planning and sustainability measures are taking shape at your institution, please? Uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, good uh, morning colleagues, apologies for coming in late. Yes, what, what in our institution at UKZN, we took a, a strategic decision really to uh, cross all the way over to fully fledged online learning and use ERT as a bridge, which will take us Hmm. I think we might have lost Professor Songa there, which is slightly ironic when we're talking about improving access. But um, uh, Professor Peterson, if I come to you next, I don't know if you have anything to add or if you could pick up along those points. 
Yeah, maybe just two points I want to add. Uh, the one is the engagement with the other sectors of the economy is so crucial. Um, the private sector industry, commerce, and also communities, because I believe that the interfacing of different knowledge systems are tremendously crucial for universities. And the pandemic also just have, have illustrated that again. So um, different institutions have different approaches. At, at our institution, we got advisory boards and most of our academic departments that brings in those sectors uh, into, into the university. So that's, 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 a, that's a, a lot of engagement. And then the second part, it is to illustrate to the university community that um, it's really about the academic project and that the digital, the technology are the tools to facilitate that. The same way that you will enable an environment, you will enable your faculty, you, your technology is, an, is, is a tool. So to, to, to drive that, we have established uh, at the University of the Free State, the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, where we co-create. Uh, it's more or less the same as, as, as what uh, Professor Pakong have mentioned on the Design Thinking School, but we co-create where we bring industry, private sector, commerce together with our academics and government to work on uh, um, digital futures, the application in agriculture, in medicine, in, in, in all parts, but it is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and it's a co-creation uh, uh, approach. And by doing that, we also have illustrated that technology is really how we can use it to enable the academic project uh, uh, rather than the other way around. Thank you, Alistair. That's great. Thank you, Professor Peterson. Um, for so we've got you back, which is great. Um, if you'd like to uh, uh, just finish the point you were making, please, that'd be, that'd be brilliant. My apologies, I don't know what, I don't know what happened. But yes, uh, my, my point was that uh, uh, appropriating and maintaining those capabilities as an institution going forward, regardless of whether, in fact, we defeat the pandemic, which is unlikely, and then return. No, we struck again. So, okay. Um, <laughs> we were doing so well. I think for four minutes to go, I think we've had a pretty good, um, pretty good show. Um, Professor, if I, can, if I can come to you to, to finish up, please. I, I have a question given you spoke about having a very comprehensive response to this originally. How ambitious can you be as, a, as an institute and, and also as a region in terms of doing things like increasing your outreach through digital education and perhaps increasing the amount of uh, international collaboration that you have in order to um, embrace the kind of multidisciplinary aspect that, that we were talking about previously, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to talk about how exactly how far can we go and, and also the concern that was raised by one of the colleagues about should we be, should we, should, should, should we expect students to come to university with the skills? And, 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 and for us at UCT, we see universities' role, one of the university's roles is to provide leadership. We, we don't respond to what happens in industry, but we also shape it and give it direction. And so we don't only complain about what comes from basic education. We can inform it, shape it, and, and solve it, and provide solutions. So, so our role, as much as it's developmental, it's also disruptive. It develops, but it's disruptive. And so, we at UCT decided to to go a step further during this time of the pandemic and disrupt the South African teaching model of basic education by launching the UCT online high school. And, and this is a way to give learners across South Africa the opportunity to develop their full educational potential before entering university or any higher learning institution or workplace environment. It's one thing to say the situation with the pandemic is not gonna be solved right now and to wait at university and say, let them come prepared. We see ourselves as a leader and we don't want to be an island of excellence. We want to spread that. But in the same way, we connect with the uh, global world because we are a global uh, um, uh, institution. We're not just focused at all. So we attend to the problems of our, our country and continent, but we connect with our peers elsewhere in the world, not just to learn, but to also to contribute to global knowledge. And so during the pandemic, we, we have been talking about what are the new models of, of internationalization of higher education, rather than sitting and waiting for the pandemic to end, and then we get on with internationalization. So, so, so we've, we've started that. Is it possible to do semester study abroad 
a, a different way. What is it about international internationalization of the student experience is key. Is it about being in the different place and going down to the coffee shop with your peers, are students being with their peers? So what does international experience look like? And so those conversations have started and we're talking even about what does it mean to develop um, a community, a virtual community of practice because this, this is what the world is getting to. And what that does for us it helps us to make this opportunity available even to students from low socioeconomic backgrounds for whom international experience was not accessible because of the, the, um, the, the fact that they can afford it. So we see this time of disruption as a time of, of problem solving, of grabbing the opportunity of contributing to basic education and making and creating an ecosystem that makes education much more quality education, much, much more accessible to more people at basic and at higher education and, and also international education available to more people. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, I, I wish you could go on, but sadly that's us at time. It's been an hour already. Um, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for today for being so generous with their time and coming in and giving us their insights. I, I think we've had representatives from South Africa, Kenya, Mauritius, Ghana. Um, it's been wonderful to hear such an international approach within the region and, and all of the great work that's going on. Um, an on-demand version of this discussion will be available on the Times Higher Education website. We will also present a summary article of the key findings. If you'd find that useful, we hope that you do. We'll be able to circulate that to you afterwards. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us and to say I hope that we can engage with you at future THE events. Thank you very much.